And now may I speak in the name of God the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I want to speak this evening from the heart about matters I would rather not disclose in my first week as Bishop of Georgia. But with protests raging around the country this week following the killings of Ahmad Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd, we all could use to let some of our own stuff surface and let God work on it. I want to be vulnerable with you for a few minutes and share something of my story. I grew up saying that my family never owned slaves, so racial unrest is not my problem. I've come to see this quite differently over time. But the truth is, whether you think issues of racism are your problem or not, our house is on fire and we're going to all have to work together. I share not to make anyone feel bad, but because this is the best way I know to name how Jesus can bring the reconciliation we all need. I was born in Montgomery, Alabama in 1963. It was a divided time in a fractured city. And while I did not understand that context is the one in which I came to learn about race, even without knowing I was being taught, I'm old enough to recall seeing water fountains and bathrooms marked colored. And I never wondered about why that was so. Just as I never wondered why I started school at a Methodist church when my grandmother ran the school lunchroom at a nearby public school. I was taught to use the word colored and never heard my parents saying racial epithets, though that was all around me. Now, my dad did buy and play for us Reb Rebel Records, a racist record label that is best not looked up by those who haven't heard of it. They were the sort of thing one would find at a Klan rally and other white supremacist gatherings. I think my father thought they were funny. Maybe I hope so. I, I don't know. They were horrifying. They were part of my childhood. I never asked about the records or why he played them for us. I just know that embedded in my childhood were messages of not sharing pool with colored children, and I learned that there was a taint, a stain I was to avoid, and it would take many years before I in examined the implicit messages I received. I came to see that the theological truth that every human is a child of God and that our differences are a gift and no one is cursed, well, that, that mattered, that, that changed things, but by the time I considered and rejected the underlying premise that different ethnicities make some people inherently better than others, well, I had a lot of words and phrases, jokes and songs that had already been implanted in my mind. There were ideas of race that were hardwired into me, and they were in the way if I wanted to love my neighbor as myself. They were separating me from God and my friends. That's sin. Racism was an important founding sin for this nation as we built great cities and wealth on, well, enslaved workers and enslaved people. The enslaver needs the enslaved to be inferior. Otherwise, how could we treat others so cruelly? In our reading from Habakkuk, the prophet cries out, Alas for you who build a town by bloodshed and found a city on inequity, and that strikes home in Savannah. It was built on the rising price of and market for cotton. It is well documented that I was consecrated Bishop of Georgia in a church paid for at least in part by money made from the slave trade and from cotton. The seal of the diocese on my ring was the personal seal of our first bishop who was a major owner of enslaved persons. We have a constant reminder in our midst of how painfully wrong people of goodwill can be when they benefit from getting the gospel wrong. We can also work to get it right. The actual ring I wear was from Bishop Stewart, who championed integration in the 1950s and received death threats for it. Habakkuk is one of those books of the Bible that I don't think you got taught in Sunday school as a child. He's what you get when you cross a more traditional prophet like Amos or Isaiah with a not afraid to complain about God to God's face character like Job. Like Amos and Isaiah, Habakkuk is righteously indignant about the moral decay of the world in which he lives. Habakkuk looks at the utter unfairness and sometimes downright evil he sees all around him and he cries out to God with words that sound like they come from one of David's psalms of lament. The prophet Habakkuk says this, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not listen or cry to you violence and you will not save? 
Why do you make me see wrongdoing and look at trouble? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law becomes slack and justice never prevails. The wicked surround the righteous, therefore judgment comes forth perverted. Habakkuk's cry seems very like the cries rising in our own nation this week. We are reeling from the COVID-19 crisis and in the midst of that rising unrest at restrictions, three more killings added new names to the long list of black and brown people who have been killed while doing things that would not put my life in danger. We should not be surprised that when injustice repeats in predictable ways that cries of how long can take some past the breaking point. If you were to read further in Habakkuk, you would learn of a greater vision of justice still coming. We have to wait for the true justice that comes from God, and in the meantime, the righteous are to live by faith. But that translation of faith is not completely right. I, I, I look it up in the New International Version, the New Revised Standard Version, and there's a text note suggesting that faithfulness might be a better translation. Faith is an agreement with a belief. Faithfulness is the practice of being more faithful. More than just head knowledge, faithfulness comes with action. God tells Habakkuk that while we wait for God's justice, we are to put the love of God into action against the injustice we see. We certainly can do this with outward action, but I have to tell you, I've learned to begin with the injustice I find in my own heart. There's an image I have of the work we need to do, and it's really close to home for me because it's in my yard. My wife Victoria and I bought a lovely 1925 bungalow in 2014. Everything inside was perfect. The yard, well, that was another story. The family that had been there and the couple that aged there across 40 years in the house, well, they took less and less care of the yard as one does. Trees had grown up close to the house, vines all around. There were thick, thorny vines that were the worst. I mean, just like thick as your finger with these spikes on them. And the thing is, they had cut it off at the surface, and then the roots would get stronger. Like when you cut grass, that it doesn't really bother the grass to be cut. They just put energy in the root system that's below the ground. And so in my struggle, I found that, well, you can't cut the vine. That seems to make the plant happy. You have to dig up the roots. For a single vine, I'd have to dig around six inches deep in an area two to four feet around, just one vine. And underground, I would find these interconnected sweet potato-like tubers. And when I dig up the roots, well, if I don't get them all, the root will grow back, like a sweet potato coming back from a little piece of a potato. It's the way you plant them. It's in the fertile soil, and they're just going to grow again. I spent the first several years worth of Mondays off from work, dirty, covered with sweat, and would take what would look like a bushel of sweet potatoes out by the road for the city to pick up. When I look at those vines, I realize that stopping sinful actions without addressing the roots of the sin within me won't bring healing. For the soil within me is fertile for sin. If I cut off the vine without removing the roots, the sin remains growing and biding its time. If you were to ask me if I'm a racist, I would swear I don't have a racist fiber in my being. And I want to mean that. I think I've rooted out all the, the racism planted within me, and then yet yeah, there'll be some event. Something will happen, and, and something will trigger in my mind, and there'll be some thoughts, some words, and I realize that that's still arising out of those messages planted in me. That's not who I want to be. That's not really what I think now. And I have to manage that inside me. It's a little embarrassing, but there it is. How is it that that's still part of who I am? But then once conscious of that response, I look to root out more of that, more of those messages I took in. And you know, this isn't just about issues of race. Just to give one other example, we see something like this in 12-step programs that begin with someone admitting that he or she is powerless against their addiction and turning the, power, the problem over to a higher power. We know the truth of this, that the higher power is Jesus who can bring healing and wholeness. Even with the Holy Trinity on our side, though, the struggle is one fought day by day and sometimes, well, hour by hour. 
The roots of the addiction grow so deep and get so entangled in our very core that it's not an easy fight. I've been on a years-long project to rewire my thinking. Reading books has opened my eyes to see the world through the eyes of others. I make sure that at least half of the books I read are by persons of color, women, people living in very different cultures who are writing about their experiences, about what life is like through their eyes. When not in a pandemic, and it's hard to concentrate, I I, I tell you, it's been hard to read lately. But for some years, I've averaged reading a book a week, and some of those on Audible, some of them reading. And that steady diet of seeing the world through the eyes of writers like the theologian Kelly Brown Douglas or the searing words of ta Coates have helped me see the world anew. Mostly, they've given me new ears through which to hear scripture and new eyes to see injustice in the world around me. There is so much more that can and should be said about the specific issues of the three killings that caused anger to boil over anew. These are public events and our society needs to confront them. We must dismantle the system that offers unequal safety and fails too often to render justice. But before I was ready to read a book like Kelly Brown Douglas' Stand Your Ground and hear her reflecting on being a black mother in a world far more dangerous for her children than for my girl. I needed to start with the roots of what was implanted within me. I had to work my way to that. I don't know what the struggle is for you, but I know each of us have things that are beneath the surface that are, well, causing problems within us, sin within us. We have worked on the outer facade, yet the inside, the sin remains. In Christ, we have a way forward, for Jesus is the good gardener. This means that our connection with God can give us a safe space to take things out and do that in our work, to weed out the junk within us that's hidden. Don't worry about what may be revealed. God already knows, and God already loves you as you are and wants to bring you healing and wholeness. This isn't about making you feel bad. This is actually about healing and making you feel better over time. Because, well, if you're like me, you need some more weeding. God gave Habakkuk the answer. answer, The righteous are to live by faithfulness. And so, well, I do those faithful things. I read the Bible every day. I pray. Since Ahmaud Arbery's killing, I've prayed not only for his family, but the father and son who killed him and their family and for the man who videoed the incident, and for his family. And I have found that changing me. It's impossible to pray for a person and not begin to truly want, well, God's will for their lives. It's become significant for me because prayer is what I can do. Praying for all involved is what faithfulness is for me right now because I really want Jesus to take the evil done and weave it together for the good. Somehow, despite the fact that I will always need to root out the sin from within, God still gives me the gift of his presence and his power in that work. Grace abounds as the work within me is the work of the Holy Spirit. It's not something I do by force of will. For God is both active in the world and present in our hearts. This doesn't mean that I don't have a role to play or you don't in bringing about more of the reconciliation for which creation longs. God's ongoing action means that the work is not ours alone, and this is good news in a troubled and troubling week. Amen.